recording. Okay, perfect. So, hi, Andy. Thanks for joining us here today. Um, you. I'll let you, you introduce yourself and a little about what you're going to talk today, but we are so excited to learn all the tips and tricks about packaging design. <laughs> nice. Oh, thank you, Patricia. I am so excited to be here. Uh, I think we've been sort of scheming on this for a while now. And so, um, you know, I, I'm grateful for your reminders and just, you, you know, get me in here because um, I, I think what we have to share will be very helpful for, for this group because, you know, we're active participants in the, um, in the Slack channels and we see a lot of these questions flying around um, because our community is mainly, you know, early stage folks that the, you have passion, you have grit, you have an idea, but you haven't, you don't know what to do. And so, um, you know, I'm hoping to, to fill in some of those gaps uh, from the packaging design perspective um, to hopefully help you guys sort of get on your journey and, and, and you know, interact with vendors easier, designers better, and, and so forth. So I'm going to pull up my screen here <clears throat> and we'll get started. And yeah, like like Patricia said, drop your Q and A's down here. I do have a, um, Patricia, I do have like multiple um, uh, um, breaks in the presentation where, you know, we can sort of ask questions. So if we want to open the floor up or if we want to like, you know, see if anyone wants to put out a question at that point, just because, you know, each each section, it's sort of like, we talk about this. Do we have questions? We talk about this. Do we have questions? So on and so forth. So um, we don't have to wait to the end for questions, uh, if that's okay. Yeah, well, however you feel comfortable. And then do you want me to like, some people rather me to like, you know, come in and help them with the questions or you just want to open the Q&A and go through them and yourself and um, take the lead? I'm fine either way. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, if If you want to be sort of looking through and then when we hit that question section, um, just pull out the relevant ones. I'm happy to answer them. Is, does that work? Yep, that's perfect. Okay, cool. Okay. okay. Okay, sounds good. All right. All right, let's get started. So in case you're wondering, this is what we're going to be talking about. <laughs> um, so just a quick rundown of what we'll actually be going over. We're going to talk about who we are. Uh, who buttermilk is, what we do, the elements of packaging design, just a few case studies of how we've applied these elements, and then some takeaways. So Buttermilk Creative is my wife and I mainly, but we have other um, contractors and other folks we work with, but it's mainly us. And we have over 16 years of experience designing for retailers and brands from the inside out. We've worked for retailers like Publix, The Fresh Market, and Wegmans, but then also smaller brands like Ha, Snacks, Oats and Coats, No Bull Burger, and Dufour, just to name a few. So these are, these are sort of smaller, some emerging brands, some more established brands that have been around for a while, but need help sort of reestablishing themselves in the category. We help them all. So this has been a while ago, but I put out a, uh, a question on LinkedIn and I said, your packaging design is the most important part of your brand. And I wanted to hear what people, especially in my network would say, because I knew it would be sort of not controversial, but I knew it would, it would elicit some responses. So it did. So Jordan Buckner, who's a great friend of of Startup CBG has his own um, his own stuff going on at Food Bevy. He said packaging is a key asset in communicating those values and promises. I really like that. David Boyle said that you know he really thinks that packaging really in good design also it encompasses essential points like positioning, branding, and uh, I like this. It can even spill into margins. So we're talking about you know, business stuff. We're not just talking about aesthetics here. Kanyang over at Prickly, he made an interesting point around 
you know, when your when your products are functional, then packaging is more important than taste. Because let's all be honest, functional stuff sometimes tastes a little funky. But for products that are not the folk function is not the focus, then taste is greater than packaging. But he did he came around and said, you know, it is design is very important. And it really is what triggers people on shelf and digitally. And then Scott Marcus, another luminary of the CPG world, uh, talked about how, you know, it is the most visible and therefore powerful representation of the brand and underlying product. So let's assume you have all that stuff all sorted out and you figured all that um, sort of foundational stuff down. We do believe that your packaging design is the most important part of your brand. So why is packaging design so important other than all those, uh, those uh, CPG experts opinions? Well, no matter how great your product is, if your customers don't pick it up off the shelf and buy it, they'll never try it. So if it looks like shit or it looks unprofessional or if it looks uh, didn't you don't they don't recognize cues or symbols in it, then they're not going to buy you. So you can spend all the time you want making this amazing product that you've poured your heart and soul into and blood, sweat and tears and all the all these cliches. But if they don't recognize it like this little box of Cheez-Its, then they're not going to buy it because it is a C. If you ever I mean, I know you, everyone here probably shops and goes to the grocery store. But it is a sea of noise and there's so much stuff there and you really need to create great packaging design and branding to really stand out on shelf. So you have this recognizable, ownable look and feel so your customers can find you. So here's a couple data points on why packaging design is so important. Shoppers only spend a few seconds in front of a shelf. Just, just do, you know, it's not even scientific. Just do your own sort of like research as you go grocery shopping. How long do you, do you, I mean, we're funky because we're CPG people. So we probably do spend a little bit more time looking at shelves, analyzing shelves, but truly we really only spend a few seconds in front of a shelf. Like I said, we're faced with so much noise, countless options and information. And then 95% of our purchases are based on emotions versus logic. We're looking for things that are speaking to us not things that, uh, you know, have the correct, you know, the, the, the best stats and all that, all that stuff. We're just really looking for something that's going to grab us by the heart. And we really have just 20 feet and one and a half seconds to attract a consumer's attention at shelf and spur a purchase. It's terrifying as a packaging designer to know that we spend months, sometimes years developing packaging for brands. And, uh, you know, countless revisions, countless rounds of, of concepts, iterating, all that stuff to then know that really, I mean, when it comes, when the rubber hits the road, 20 feet and one and a half seconds, <laughs> but, you know, it's the world we live in. So it's okay. And I love how Lumi, you know, the packaging manufacturer company, they're, they're, they're a great asset. But I love, I wish I could, I wish I'd come up with this, but they say packaging is the new storefront. And I think they, th this spills into e-commerce. I'm not talking about e-commerce today. I'm talking about mainly retail packaging, but this also, I think they also touch on e-commerce and, you know, how a box shows up on your um, doorstep. But anyways, packaging is the new storefront. For your customers, packaging defines your ability to provide a memorable environmentally friendly and convenient experience. I mean, that's, you can't, that, that was perfect. That's why I, I didn't steal it because I, I attributed it to them, but I love that they, you know, really summed it up in that way. Um, so Patricia, here's our first question. Stop. Do we have any, have any questions so far? We do have one from Hannah and I hope I'm saying the name right, but um she she does her own like traditional milk tea and she been buying uh temper evident sealed bottles on Amazon and she's curious to know what product development is like 
and what I should do to get them oh, into gosh. my local grocery stores, like pop-up grocer, for example. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, well, <clears throat> I'm going to say that I don't know. Uh, but what you will see, I mean, there. she's already buying some sort of vessel to put her product in. Um if you're going to make it at scale, which I'm not an expert at this, at this, but if you're going to make it at scale, you're going to need to, you know, operate within some sort of commercial kitchen or co-man, co-packer. Uh, but at the very least, just to bottle it up for, I don't, for farmer's markets, I don't know what pop-up grocer, what their sort of like, you know, requirements are. But let's say you're just going to go into a farmer's market. What you're doing sounds fine. You just need to make sure you create a compelling label and, and brand story and things like that. So, um, you know, sort of, like I said, the foundational stuff that I, I described earlier. But I mean, as far as like, are, are you doing it the right way? I don't know, because there's all sorts of stuff that needs to happen to to bring it to, to make it commercially viable, like from a production standpoint that I just from a from an aesthetic standpoint, I can't speak to. Yeah, and I think like a lot of different grocers has different regulations, like the FDA and everything. I think that's a question that also you can ask in our Slack that, channel, and I think you're going to find better answers for it. And then also, we got another question, but it's anonymous, asking also about saving for food scientists, and this is also a question that you should drop in the Slack. Yeah, um, these are great, great like sort of initial questions and good good that these you know brands are thinking about this stuff ahead of time um but yeah like i know jamie at catapult he can he can help with he's always on the slack helping with um i know they've done a couple of webinars so th th these are perfect questions for sort of the operational folks yeah um so alex asked what makes a product stand out on the shelf Hmm. <laughs> uh, let's park that. And then we might touch on that later on when we look at some, some uh, case studies and designs. <laughs> okay. And then we have, what are your top three tips to provide customers a flawless unboxing experience? A flawless what? <laughs> unboxing experience. So like when you open a package. Oh, a box? A, yeah. I gotcha. Okay. Um, so for unboxing, I always think about, you know, there's only one brand in the world that can just show up and like literally like throw a cardboard box on your doorstep and then that be it. And that's Amazon. You know, like they literally can like, they can't do any less. I mean, yeah, they've done more. They've done some stuff to decorate their boxes and stuff every once in a while for Prime Day or if they're promoting a movie or whatever. But they really can just like literally take a dump on your porch and that and we're like, oh, it's Amazon. So everyone else, all of us who are out here, you know, trying to do e-commerce from our own websites, we do have to to strive a little harder to create a beautiful unboxing experience that starts with your outer box, your secondary packaging. So, you know, be thinking about what are some economical ways that I can add some personality to that outer box that's not just like a cardboard box with a shipping label so can you print your logo on it can you do some um, custom printed tape there's ways to not have to spend a ton of money with your shipping supplies where you can customize things okay so that's the outer box then on the inside what are the things that you're doing do you have a do you have a primary um sampler box or some sort of box inside there that's going to stay pretty that's not going to get beat up in the mail that is meant to be taken you know that's meant to be opened up so you have like tissue paper around it or you know it's it has all the you know full color design on it is there an insert is there a brochure is there something that's telling the story with a qr code and driving people to your website um are the products, you know, like nicely placed in inside that interior box, all that sort of stuff um, needs to be thought about for like a perfect unboxing experience. But I do think that that is a, a thing that is lacking in a lot of e-commerce business, D2C businesses is 
their attention to detail with unboxing. And it really, there's no formula. I mean, I just described sort of a, a scenario, but there's no, like, you don't always have to have a insert. You don't always have to have an inside box. You don't always have to have tissue paper. I just sort of described sort of one path that you could take, but there's a lot of paths. It's, it's more about what's appropriate for your brand. Are there stickers? Is there other merch that you just throw in there as delight for your customers? That's, that's what you have to think about. Perfect. Um, I think one thing as a consumer, I just don't want my product to be like open and all like everywhere, but I do think it's nice. Like, yeah. Just in the box. Yeah. It's weird. It's like, what, what happened <laughs> between <laughs> when it shipped and when it's got to me? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. We have two other questions and I don't know if you want to answer them now or later, but are there core packaging design differences between products who main channel is online retailer, the RD2C versus traditional grocery uh, stores or brick and mortar? Yeah. So as I mentioned, I mean, mainly what I'm focused on in this presentation is um, design for retail, on shelf, physical, you know, on shelf. So, but in my experience, uh, I think the differences are, I mean, outside of what you mentioned, mentioned, Patricia, is that retailers, the FDA, other folks have very specific requirements needed for the packaging. Um, but beyond that, I mean, the, the for me, the main differences between D to C and sort of like a, a digital only product versus a um, versus a physical on shelf product is you have more you have more tools when you sell like on Amazon or on your own website, because you, you have multiple, uh, multiple opportunities for storytelling. So you're not just depending on a label, you have multiple pictures that you can, you can show, you have multiple, you know, insights that you can share and like infographics and all that kind of stuff. If you think about like a traditional e-commerce like Amazon page or Shopify page or whatever, there's that, there's the big image. And then there's all those thumbnails of like different product attributes and different ways to, to like romance the product that you don't have the benefit of on shelf. You also have all the benefits of keywords and SEO and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so you, you, I still think you, I think any brand and this will get like broader philosophical, but I think any brand needs to explore retail at some point. So while you're, while you might be D to C right now and just e-commerce, you need to design your packaging in a way that will work on shelf. Because eventually that's where you're going to need to be, because that's really how you'll get that scale. And, um, and then, you know, you can supplement that retail ready packaging design with the the additional images like I talked about and, and all the other strategies that that help you succeed on like Amazon and your own e-commerce shop. But that's the main thing that I notice is that packaging on shelf has to work harder because it doesn't have all that extra marketing materials and, and strategies in there. And then just a follow-up question is, and then is there any difference between products who are category creators, like a new ingredient or food from another part of the world versus products who are in established categories? I mean, the difference is, I think one, you, you sort of have to do a lot of education. So if you're, if you're a new innovative product that can plug into an existing category, like Halo Top into ice cream, <laughs> clearly you don't have to teach people what ice cream is, you know? You just have to tell them why you're better uh, versus like, oh no, we're we're this new funky, you know, pepper from, you know, wherever that um, does all these antioxidant health things. You've never heard of us. You're not used to eating peppers and yogurt before, but this is pepper yogurt. You know, like you're going to have to do a ton more education around that versus someone who is in, who is innovating within a existing category. 
it's not not impossible. Obviously, there's plenty of case studies that that do that, but it is a you're you're pushing a big boulder up a hill if you're in that camp. Great. Uh, we had another few coming up, but you want to continue? Yeah, the questions I'll keep, or? yeah, I'll keep going. And I love all yeah. the questions. And that means that we have an engaged audience, which there's nothing worse than <laughs> crickets. So I love it. But um, and we'll get to as many as we can. But yeah, let's keep going. I'm going to crank through some more stuff. Um, OK, cool. So now we're going to get into sort of the more of the I don't know, the technical aspects of, of packaging design. This all happens before, you know, me as a designer gets involved, but it's stuff that you as founders need to need to be aware of and think about. So the first thing you have to think about is what is your product going to go in? Retail packaging format. So like, what is the vessel my amazing product is going to go in? So some of those options are glass jars, aluminum cans, plastic bottles, cardboard or corrugated boxes, paperboard boxes or folding cartons, flexible packaging or pouches, or even custom. I don't know, maybe you maybe there's not a format out there that works for you, so you got to go go out there and find your own. But these are all the things that you really need to sort of think through and uh and, and sort of um know and then, you know, this terminology, you know, these, these categories, these types of product um, formats are what you'll communicate with vendors. So if you're talking with a co-packer, you'll ask them, you know, you'll talk to them about the, what their capabilities are. You'll understand what, what they're able to fill and, and do with your product. We'll skip this for now. The next one is uh, dye lines. So, so, so far you've figured out your product, what it's going to be, your brand, hopefully, all that kind of stuff. And then now you've figured out what your product is going to go into. Now it's time to figure out what, what, is, what are the parameters that we're going to put the design into. So that is either going to be a label, it's going to be a, a pouch die line, it's going to be a folding carton die line. But either way, it's, it's going to be some sort of die line that your manufacturer and printer is going to share with you to, um, to then share with the designer so they know sort of what are the boundaries that I'm going to design within. What are the requirements that I need to do? So in this case, this is a die line for a yogurt container. So you can see that it gives you clear direction on this is, oops, this is where you put the, the, um, the, the front display panel, also known as the PDP principal display panel. This is where you're going to put the UPC. This is where you're going to put the nutrition box uh, and, and other technical stuff. So it goes into some detail about, and then, you know, these are, this is the, that blue line is where the, the type can, or, you know, the design can go. So we know that we can't go outside of those margins. This is just another example of a chip bag. So you can see like, a chip bag, you know, we're used to looking at on shelf, it's this nice little tidy, um, you know, tall rectangle. But when it's a when it's a flat piece of film, it looks like this. And so we as designers need to know, like, oh, okay, so this is the front, these are the this is the back, but it's divided into two sides with a flap. Uh, and we can sort of read through this and sort of understand what are what what are we how are we designing around this. And then this is a folding carton. So you can see, I understand that this will be the front. And then we've got some sides here. We've got a back. We've got some flaps and things like that. But it'll eventually be folded into this nice, tidy little box. Die lines also tell us other information, like where is this thing going to fold, which is this dotted line in this particular um, die line. Where is the flap going to be? It's, it's this little extra little area here. Where's the trim? Where's it gonna seal? This is an eye mark. That's sort of something for the printer to, to know sort of where to either cut or when to start a new run or think that kind of stuff. And then it also tells us the dimensions, which is important because 
you know, when you can zoom in infinite degrees on, you know, Illustrator or whatever design application you're working on, things can get out of whack. You can design things that maybe won't work at scale. And so we need to know what those true dimensions are so we can design things so we know, you know, make sure they, every all the elements are the right size and all that kind of stuff. The die lines also tell designers really important stuff like what's the material? What is this printing on? What's are there any special finishing options? So, you know, in the in the case of a um of a of a chip bag, is there going to be a hang hole at the top? In this case, there was not. But if there was, we wouldn't want to put any design elements up there because it's just going to get punched out. What are the measurements? I already mentioned how important those are. And then the color info. So, like, what are we doing? Any spot colors here? Uh, this is just a four color um, print job here with a white layer. Um, but this is where we would list any kind of like special um, brand colors, uh, special spot PMS colors. This is also where we would talk about, is there going to be any matte varnish or gloss varnish or any kind of like special finishing thing like that? That would all happen in this area as well. There's also uh, printer specs. So every print job should come with one of these, which this is for a dry offset printing process um, from Berry Plastics, but it basically tells you how small can your type be, what are the type of inks that are going to be used, um, and then other very specific design stuff like trapping, line width, dot gain that only designers know, but, but a good designer will ask you for the print spec document from your printer so that we can set up our files properly for you know, when we send them off to print, because the last thing you want to do is create something that's not print ready and it goes off to your print vendor. And the print vendor says, well, I can't use this. At the very, at the worst, he says, they say, I can't use this and they just reject it. At the, at the best, they say, oh, we can use this, but we have to send it through our pre-press department. And that's going to be another, you know, 500 to a thousand bucks in pre-press work. Uh, to make your files print ready, which, you know, you're probably already investing a, a good chunk of change printing your product to begin with. That's the last thing you want to do. So us designers, packaging designers, try to mitigate that and try to get things as, as buttoned up as we can before it goes off to the printer for production. Some other elements of packaging design is what we call the technical content. So this is your nutrition facts panel, which has to I don't care if you're selling D to C or retail or whatever, go ahead and get in the habit of getting these created for all your products and uh, learning about the different formats and um, making sure you include these on all your products along with the ingredient statement, same deal. Those need to go on everything. Um, it just saves you a lot of pain and suffering for when you eventually do get on, in retail. And they generally, ingredient statements generally go after the nutrition facts panel. So like you see here, they're usually stacked on top of each other. At least that's our sort of best practices. UPC. So I'm not going to go in, we could do a whole webinar about how to get a UPC, but UPCs need to go on your packaging and need to be clear, legible, don't mess with them. I mean, you can do some fun stuff with them, um, but, but really make sure you understand the minimum size and height that a UPC needs to be for scanning. The last thing you want to do is piss off a, a retailer because your UPC won't scan. Net weight, net contents is also referred to. Uh, that has to go on the front and uh, needs to be a certain height based on your um, the size of your, your square inch of your packaging, the PDP. And um, and then it has to be formatted properly. So you can sort of see the formatting there. And then any kind of like, you know, certification. So either your USDA organic, non-GMO project, those folks also have very specific requirements around how they want their certifications, their logos to appear in your packaging. Minimum height requirements, minimum width requirements, colors, all that kind of stuff. And they should tell you all that in like a brand guidelines but you need to take those into account as you design. Patricia, I'm going to pause here and see if there's any Q&As before we get into this part. 
Um, yeah, we actually have one interesting. What would you suggest is starting with first, the design or the physical packaging? Ooh, I love it. So a lot of times, it's a, it is a tough question. So a lot of times, um, as early stage, you know, brands, you don't have the benefit of having something existing out there that you're sort of redesigning or, or, or designing within. So you need examples or, or at least mock-ups that you can then shop around to co-packers or co-mans or, or investors or whatever to just see if the idea is relevant. So I think you need to have a good idea of roughly what the the what what the um vessel is going to be you know like i think everyone knows like i don't know what the design's going to look like but i know my baking mix is going to go into a box versus a pouch or whatever and so i do think that you need to spend some time thinking about that before you go into design it doesn't mean that you have to nail it down it just means that you know to to create some sort of mock up or engage with a designer they're going to need to know what what is, what is it going to go into? How is it going to be, you know, brought into the world? I, so I would start with what it's going to go into first before you get into design. Thank you. Um, does the packaging MFGR, I hope I'm saying that right, provide the DLI template? Sorry, there are some terms that I'm not familiar with. Let me see if I can find this in the... Uh, okay. It's from David Ray. Is it? It's open. Yeah. Okay. It's the. Four. Oh yeah. Oh, does the packaging manufacturer provide the dialing template? Yes, the the packaging manufacturer should provide a dialing template. Sometimes you'll get a dialing template from your co-packer because they have their lines are set up with certain to to accommodate certain um, types of um packaging so like for instance to go back to the baking mix example if you're working with a baking mix um, manufacturer and you're like hey i want to put my baking mix that i'm you're developing for me or you you know you're gonna bring to scale for me i want to put it in a glass jar they'd be like we pack our baking mixes in you know bags that then go into a box <laughs> So, so in that case, you know, like they're driving that train and they're going to give you that box die line and you really, you're just going to have to, to suck it up and do it. Um, so yes, a lot of times the, either the, the printer will give it to you or the, um, or the co-packer will give it to you, co-manufacturer. Co Thank you. I'm learning something new every day. <laughs> <laughs> oh Yeah. <laughs> Uh, do you recommend any resources for learning the requirements for technical information? Do you recommend hiring a compliance expert early on? Yeah, so the FDA, believe it or not, the FDA website is a is a great resource for learning requirements. Um, that you know they they have you know PDFs upon PDFs that you can comb through to just understand basics like uh, how big does the net content need to be? What kind of ingredients do I have to claim? Uh, do I have to claim these certain allergens and things like that? And so I reference it pretty frequently. And so I think it's a, that's a good place to go is the fda.gov website. And then once you get to prime time and you're like, you're, you're engaging with uh, retailers and you're, you're just getting larger, then absolutely bring in some sort of compliance, compliancy person, because we just have worked with a lot of brands that have gone into grocery stores. We've worked on private label products that go into grocery stores. So we just over time have learned a lot of these guidelines, but by no means are we legally bound to you know, we're, we're not lawyers. So like, I think at some point you do need to engage with some sort of compliancy person, not only around your, the, all the FDA stuff and like the, um, you know, there, the, that packaging guidelines, but also around any kind of claims you're making, um, or anything like that, you know, just make sure you're not going to get sued 
is is worth you know a few thousand bucks thank you um maybe last one and then we continue with... yeah that's perfect it seems like the latest trend is towards very colorful minimalist packaging with unique fonts but this appears to me to not display product values slash characters and it's less readable from a distance. Do you recommend following this trend or any other thoughts on this trend? <laughs> I have been, yeah, th this is speaking my language because mm -hmm. I have been, uh, I've been mulling this over for a while now. And, you know, I've tried to, I've tried to figure out how to assign like a a genre or like a, you know, how do we categorize? How do we talk about this new, all these new products that are hitting the market that look so radically different than what we're used to? And um, and for me, being a traditional, you know, retail packaging designer, it's it's very confusing and it's very um I don't understand it. It makes me feel irrelevant. You know, like I, I'm like, I don't get it. Like, why is this aesthetic so like, why is it so popular? You know, it literally looks like it's been designed on PowerPoint or Corel draw, but people love it. I guess. I don't know. I haven't seen the sales numbers, but I'm going to go ahead and guess because we're talking about it, that it's popular. So one person told me a good explanation is that because of the because of the pandemic and the increase in our consumption of D to C e-commerce brands, we are now seeing that impact on retail shelves because retailers have took on notice that you know these more funky brands are emerging. Not all of them are going to you know resonate with customers, but they at least want to bring them to shelf so that they can be especially you think about Sprouts or some of these more progressive grocery stores. So they can be, you know, in line with, with even more progressive grocery stores like Foxtrot and Pop-Up Grocer and Air One. And, and so they're bringing, we're seeing more and more of these funky products on shelf at more conventional grocery stores. And so I don't know. I mean, I, I still think that in what you'll see in this, presentation, there are certain principles that will always work. I think, I don't think you should ever follow trends or fads, no matter what. And if you're designing packaging, you don't look at packaging design for inspiration. You look at fashion, cars, art, art history, that kind of stuff. Um, and so in that, and, and the brand, like you have to let the brand inspire you too. So no matter what other folks are doing, that might be more brand appropriate for them. doesn't mean that it might, it, it's going to apply it to the brand that you're working on. So that's a long winded answer because I've been thinking about it a lot. <laughs> that was an interesting answer, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think it's also like what resonates with your brand, right? It's not yeah. just like jumping on a trend, but this. Yeah whatever story you want to tell and yeah. like the customers will attract with exactly. that packaging. Yeah, that's perfect. So you want to continue and then we, yeah. we have a few more. Yeah, let's keep going. So, um, so moving along here. So we've talked about the structure, the, the vessel, the, the sort of format that your product's going to go into. We've talked about some of the um, specific things that, that need to go onto that packaging. Now we're ready to like get into the design of it. And the design is really broken into a few different areas on your packaging. So there is always going to be some sort of thing called the PDP or front of pack principal display panel. And, and the FDA refers to it as PDP. So that's why I'm referring to it. And there's certain things, which I'll show you in a sec, that need to go on the PDP. But that's really obviously the, the first thing that your customers are going to see if it's merchandised correctly. We're all assuming that, you know, your, your, your packaging, your product isn't like flipped upside down and on the floor. But <laughs> let's assume that it's merchandised correctly. And so that's what people are going to see first. And then obviously, as you go around the packaging, there's other um, places. So then 
The other place is called the back of pack, which is where you do a lot of the storytelling and technical content. What you're seeing here is a folded carton for a veggie burger. So you're, you're, there's multiple areas, multiple panels that we can add design to. So we've got, obviously the front is there. We've got cooking instructions to the, to the left of the front. In cartons, normally the nutrition facts will go to the, to the right of you know, the right side that you're looking at. Um, so the nutrition facts wrap around the right. And then obviously you have the back with the UPC and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, labels are going to be totally different, but sort of follow the same sort of look and feel of how things will go around. Uh, same with pouch bags. You'll see all that in a second. So on the front of pack, these are the, uh, we think, sort of the, the primary elements that you're going to need to include or that you, you, you have to include. So you need to have your logo, obviously. You need to have your product identifier. So normally that is whatever your product is. In this case, this is a veggie burger. So normally product identifiers need to be 50% point size or you know in height to the logo. So in this case, you can see that that's, that, that checks out here, but that is what this product is. It's not the flavor, it's the actual product. Then we have some sort of brand imagery here. In this case, it's the various ingredients that make up the veggie burger. Then we have a product image. In this case, it's a patty. We have relevant call outs. So we did a quite a few um, surveys to understand what are the what are the things that really resonate with the noble veggie burger customer. And those the the two things that bubbled up to the top, in addition to just looking tasty was um, protein and fiber. So that's how we landed on including these two call outs on the front. And then the, obviously there's a flavor uh, tag that you need to bring in there. The net weight that is required. And as I mentioned, needs to be a certain height based on the square inch of your PDP. And then any kind of relevant certification. So in this case, they're non-GMO certified. So we wanted to put that in front because They've invested a good amount of money in becoming non-GMO verified. And so you want to make sure that customers understand that and can see that front and center. And then as we go around to the back, we see that there is nutrition facts. As I mentioned, that's sort of as you go around to the right side of the, of the carton, nutrition facts. So nutrition facts come in all sorts of formats, depending on how big your packaging is. So if you have a tiny little packaging label, like if you're making a, a, a small like spice jar, you don't have to use this really big, tall nutrition facts panel. I see so many brands that have small labels just scale this down, which is you can't even that's not even that's not right. You can't do that because you can't read it. But they make available, and your designer should be able to create this a smaller, more simplified linear format for your nutrition facts panel. There's also, there's tabular, there's linear, there's, there's, um, there's like a condensed, you can just, there's a lot of different options there for your nutrition facts panel. So in this case, you can see that we're using the full panel and we're even calling out a few different, um, you know, vitamins and minerals that we think would be in, relevant to, to the core customer. But this is not, this is like a above and beyond nutrition facts panel. Um, but just, I guess my point there is make sure you do your research and understand the different variations and formats. Then, like I said, the ingredients follow after that. Some sort of con contained statement or an allergen statement might go after this. And then distribution statement, you have to have that. And then a, additional messaging certifications. As we go to the back, UPC, that's, you have to have that. Maybe you, your product needs a best buy date. This is where the best buy date goes for Noble. We've been including QR codes on a lot of our brands packaging now to, to send them back to the either their, their uh, online shop or to additional information, uh, recipes, whatever it is. That's a great tool. 
that I think is becoming more or not becoming it's it's now but now a relevant you know piece of communication there's obviously directions or instructions and you don't have to sort of be boring with that like here we tried to make it sort of fun and then for uh and then obviously universal brand messaging or even this could be even be like product specific if you want to like dig into each flavor or whatever but in this case we just sort of made it universal for each and then you need to look at your packaging out in the world. So as we were iterating for Noble packaging, we knew that they were going to go into Whole Foods and we knew they were going to uh they were going to be in the frozen section obviously with all the uh all the um other veggie burgers. And so we um went to the Whole Foods our local Whole Foods, took a picture of it and then dropped it in there you know digitally in photoshop so that as we're iterating on it we sort of understand what what are what are we are we seeing you know are there things that are consistent with the category are there things that will help us stand out um how can we sort of iterate this as we develop this packaging but it's always good to see you can even we did this digitally but a lot of times we'll print things off and actually physically go to the store and put stuff on shelf and get really weird looks from other customers or from store employees. But, you know, it, it's amazing. You can do some like very um, unscientific research there as well, you know, from, from, uh, from folks that are shopping the category. And, um, and it's just good to get out away from your computer because, you know, design looks great when it's sitting right there, you know, on a white background in a PDF, but it, it'll look totally different when it goes on to shelf like I said, with all the noise and all the, the the crowded category that you might be going into. So Patricia, do we want to pause again for some questions? Yeah, there are some questions that is very related to what you're showing. And by the way, I'm getting hungry just seeing <laughs> right. the burgers right now. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, so one of the question is how important is having a visual image or a visual of the actual product via clear packaging when it comes to product packaging? Because I noticed that Nobu, you you show how you know will look, but it's not the clear packaging. So yeah, so um, it it really is dependent on your your product. Um, I do think that it is the like the most important thing is to try and make it as appetizing as like, you know, just like delicious as possible. And um, but then, you know, there's there's different little like nuances in there. So like in in Noble's case, they they used to have a window and now they don't because the window, especially for frozen stuff, doesn't look all that great. Um, a lot of times it could be foggy. It could have just have certain issues with it. And so it wasn't doing the, it wasn't doing the product any benefit. So that's why we went with showing an actual like cooked patty with the ingredients. Um, but, and then we also, it was very uh, intentional that we didn't show it in a burger because Noble, even though it's called a veggie burger, because that's sort of what we all understand is, is what the product is. It can be used in so many other things. It can be like crumbled on a salad. It can be put into a, a taco. It can be what, I mean, there's so many, so many things that can be done with it. So we didn't want to lock people into, you know, this has to go on a veggie burger, like you see, or on a burger, on a bun, like you see so many other veggie burgers do. But I think I think showing the product is is very important. And if you can get a very realistic depiction of it, that's important because I think it really conveys to the customer what they're going to get. And if you can make it look really delicious, that's even more important. I'm mute, sorry. Um, thank you. <laughs> in, in regards to copy on packaging, what are the most important categories and or message we need to include on our package? Hmm. Well, that's very specific to your um, to your product. And so, but I will tell you that, um, so, so I think 
first start off and understand your category, understand your customer and your audience and, and sort of what messages and what keywords and what sort of claims are going to resonate with them. And then, but you don't put all those on your packaging. You then have to figure out and boil it down to like the top three, top two um, claims that you that, that you want to include on your packaging. Um, so I can't tell you specifically what, you know, what they what they are, because it really is very category and, and audience dependent, customer dependent. Um, but you don't want to overflow your your packaging design with a bunch of words. You want it to be very like, like I said, like you only have so much time with your customer. So you really need to to add those very relevant points um, that they can read quickly. And then one more, I have understood the seven elements is the maximum. In your experience, how many elements of brand of pack is too many? <laughs> um, let's see. How many elements on front? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think over... Uh, I think over that sort of, I guess it's seven, uh, that number would be too many, you know, like, I mean, I think if you went in and tried to add like 10, 10 claims, and then you have your product image, you have your flavor, you have certifications there, you have your logo, you have all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's going to be very crowded and no one's going to know where to look. You're going to have to make everything so small that you wouldn't know what, what to look at. Um, so. So seven it is. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, but yeah, seven overall elements, I guess is the right answer, but like, but really, I, I really see, I see the, 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 especially on our, on our um, Slack group, I see a lot of the early brands trying to communicate too much on their packaging through all the different claims that they're trying to make on their packaging. So there's certain things that you have to have there. You're not going to replace your logo with an additional claim, you know? So like that's a fixed element, your flavor or your product identifier is a fixed element, net weight, obviously that kind of stuff. So I think it really comes down to like, if you have four or more claims, that's too much. Like selling points, what, how, whatever, you know, sort of like terminology you want to use, but basically like, you know, low in sugar, whatever, protein, fiber, all that kind of stuff. I really think that like two is a great number, but three is sort of pushing it. And then any anything beyond that is you're in the danger zone. Thank you. Do we want to continue a little more? Let's keep going. Yep. All right. So we're going to look at some examples. And then I have a quick little um, little uh, offer <laughs> that I'm going to share with you guys. And then we can take any more questions before we wrap up because we're getting close to the time here. So um, you've seen you know, the Noble packaging uh, throughout this presentation, but I just wanted to, to share a little bit more about this. So we help the Noble team uh, redesign their packaging and their branding um, to, like I said, like how do we break through the category and how do we look different from, from the other veggie burgers out there? Being an upstart, being sort of a, a veggie burger that is not wildly or widely known. And then also they were going to be doing, they're doing a, uh, they're into it now, but at the time when we redesigned this, they were doing a national whole foods launch. So we really wanted to make a big impression here. So we felt like this packaging did it. It performed really well when we did surveys and, and A-B testing. Uh, so um, so we felt really good about it. And it, I, I think, you know, I'm biased, but I think it looks really good on shelf. And then here you can see where we built out the, 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 the system. So I didn't even get into this. This is a whole nother presentation, but you're going to create line extensions. You're going to create other products with it under your, your brand. And so you need to design that initial packaging design as a system that can then get plugged into 
other, you know, other flavors and other products can get plugged into that system. So, um, so in this case, we just have four additional flavors um, based on this original um, packaging design. But you can see like the, the color changes, the image changes, these call outs might change, and then the product name changes, but everything else is, is still it stays the same. So that when you look at it on shelf, it's all lined up. It creates a nice brand block and it creates good presence there. And then, you know, obviously this design, which we've played with this before, this could go onto a pouch bag. This could go uh, into a larger box or whatever. So we've really designed this so that it can be very flexible as they expand their product offering. Another brand we've helped, which is another, uh, which is a, a, a frequent contributor on uh, Startup CBG is Eureka Tortilla. And so we helped them redesign their packaging because they were going into, they used to have a, a smaller print area, uh, sort of a label that went on these clear bags and they actually went to a full bleed um, wrap. And so we were actually able to take more advantage of the, all the surfaces. And so we helped them sort of think through like, how do we, what, what, how are we going to um, add more information, add more design and elements to really help them tell their story and take advantage of a clear bag so that because they make artisan tortillas, like you don't want to cover all this up with design. You want to show, show the, uh, the tortilla there. So we, we needed to sort of do a delicate balance of like this little band is going to capture, you know, hold the all the information, and then over here is going to be where you see the beautiful tortilla. And these also are helpful because if they're merchandised flat versus standing up, you still can see what the what the product is on this little flap here. And you can see how, again, like how we've created a system where the color changes, product name changes, but other than that, everything else stays the same. And finally, Oats and Coats, another uh, another startup CPG brand. We helped them to redesign uh, their printed cup, and then that led led into designing their larger stand up pouches. So you can see that you know the stand up pouch is significantly bigger than the cup, and so it it afforded us with more opportunity, more real estate to build out their brand story and their visuals. And just sort of have fun with the, it's a they are a super fun um, brand that has a lot of imagery and a lot of content. And so we were able to sort of, you know, have fun with that as we built it out into these bigger um, experiences. You can see how, you know, each flavor is sort of built out. So we really tried to obviously create a system with a cup, you know, where it has this rest, uh, ingredient band at the top that then carried over into the uh, into the pouch and Otis, their their mascot is down there in the corner. He's down in there in the corner of the uh, of all the pouches and so on and so forth. So this is an example of you know you've got a rigid cup, printed cup, and then you have a flexible packaging pouch that we then needed to apply that design to two different designs. This another thing that I, I'm just going to touch on is we needed to make sure that we were specifying colors that were going to look consistent between a printed cup and a printed pouch. So this blue color is a specific PMS color that we knew was going to read correctly, whether it was printed on a cup or on a pouch. And so that was important that we didn't, you know, specify a color that was going to look wildly different because they can, again, that's a whole nother, um, a whole nother webinar about printing colors. But uh, those are sort of the things you have to think about as you broaden your, your product line extensions and things like that. So just real quick, here's our packaging design best practices. Use simple direct messaging that really resonates. Uncover core messaging that the consumer immediately responds to on an emotional level. Develop key product points that are direct, simple to assimilate, and support the emotional response with rational reasons to make the purchase, strive for an ownable, unique package structure, color, and strong visual cues, oops, as brand identifiers and differentiators. And finally, develop a well-planned packaging design system and support it with a style guide 
because one-off packaging designs can lead to a lack of brand cohesiveness. And we've seen that with a lot of startup brands, early stage brands, you, you sort of like sprint to finish that one product to get it to market. And then it comes to developing the next one and it doesn't translate. Whatever design decisions were made on that initial product won't translate to the new product. And so you have to reinvent the wheel. You just have to redesign, which isn't the end of the world. And you're going to have to redesign no matter what. Usually within the first one or two years, brands will redesign everything. So that you should just expect that. But, um, but if you go into it thoughtfully and you're thinking about the, the broader view, the five to 10 year down the road view, where you're going to have multiple products, then, you know, definitely uh, you won't, you, you'll have less friction as you're developing. So real quick, this is what we offer a lot of startup early stage brands, which is what we call our packaging design audit. And this is a diagnostic checklist. So if you've had a designer, you've had your cousin, you've had, you know, your neighbor, your husband, your wife, someone on Fiverr, someone on Canva, someone on whatever, design your packaging and you want a professional to actually look at it and give you a checklist of what's working and what's not, this is what that is. So we'll, we will comb through, you'll send us a PDF, we will comb through it, we will uh, you know, give you recommendations on what to change. We'll actually mark up the PDF and say, your net weight needs to be bigger. You actually need nutrition facts here, so on and so forth. And then we'll also go through some design recommendations just based on our perspective as, as packaging designers. And then we'll also do what's called a VER analysis where we'll actually take your, your PDPs and we will run them through a system where it'll give us um, you know, some, some data points to then, you know, for you to inform you on what you might need to adjust. So like, for instance, if you're air in this particular example, you've get one of these data points as area of interest. If you really want your logo to stand out, but it's not standing out with our, you know, with the system, then this will tell you like, okay, we need to bump up the contrast. We need to do this or that to make our, our logo stand out. But it's just a good, good um, insight into your packaging design and what you can improve or what is working. Um, so there's, there's these four different, uh, insights that it'll give us that we'll walk you through. And normally that is $750, and we have it for $500 for our startup CPG folks. So um, I think, you know, obviously, Patricia, this is the end of it. Um, so uh, this will be circulated in some way. Um, but if anyone has any questions or anything like that, don't hesitate to um, reach out to me and, and ask me questions. And I'd, I love to, to, to see what you're working on and how I might be able to help. Thank you. Yeah, and is also in this Slack if you guys want to yep. ping him there. Um, do you want to answer just like two questions? Yeah, I let's do it. Okay. Yep. Actually, one of the questions is um, kind of what show less like so how brand managers measure if the design of a package was successful or not? How do they measure consumer engagement? <laughs> um, I guess through sales. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you but, think you can measure from like the... the? Yeah, so, so yeah, so, well, so this, this analysis, I think, and we can also do, I'm just showing the, um, the packaging analysis, but we can also do shelf set analysis with the same with these same four um insights so um i think you can i think the way that that's the the clearest measurement is obviously through is it selling or not if it's not selling then that would be where you could use this tool to then like understand like, well, is it because we're just not standing out on shelf? Is it because our design is not, you know, we're, we're just not having breakthrough? Um, you know, in the case of like Noble, we did this, the analysis on their existing packaging versus their, the new proposed packaging. And we did, we did both surveys with Whole Foods customers 
And then also we did, we ran it through this analysis, which is just obviously AI and computer telling us what to do. Both of them rated or, you know, like said that the new packaging was far better than the existing. And I think it went from like a 45% purchase intent to like a 75, 80% purchase intent. And so that's another way, you know, like doing surveys and, and like polling your customers or, you know, going through a more like um, going through a survey platform and putting up A-B testing to sort of see what, how to measure the success. But so it's, it's sales. And then beyond that, you could do this analysis or you can do surveys to sort of understand what, how is this packaging performing? Thank you. And then how much value do you see with including QR codes on packaging? Is there reasonable activation of those? I rarely see folks in grocery stores using the QR codes. Yeah, I don't know how much people use it on shelf, but I'm, 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 I know I use it when I get home. And so this is very anecdotal, but I think that's when people engage with QR codes is if it's not on like a shelf dangler or some sort of merchant, you know, like a marketing in, in store marketing piece, then I think when it's on packaging, it's usually interacted with uh, after they've purchased it at home. And I think the, the better you understand how your customer shops and if you can even do this, like for instance, if you can, if you can, you know, send them to your store. So like in Noble's case, I keep going back to them, but in Noble's case, it's expensive for them to ship frozen veggie burgers. So we drive people to the QR code goes to their recipe page where people can learn about all the different ways that you can use Noble, which is what we want people to do. We don't want people to think, oh, I'm not having burgers tonight. I'm having a salad, so I can't eat no bowl. No, yes, you can. You can have tacos or whatever. And so we want to plant those seeds in people's minds. And so, yeah, I mean, I think what when I also think about QR codes, I also think about, well, what, what would that real estate be used if it's not with a QR code? Is it going to be like social media icons? Is it going to be you know, some sort of other brand messaging, tertiary brand messaging, why not use it with something that may or may not get clicked and, and sort of drive some, some interest and some additional information. Um, now there are, you can invest in QR codes that track landing pages, all that kind of stuff to, to really understand if you're, you know, you really want to dig into like, what is, why am I putting this on my packaging? But for me, it's always been just sort of like a, why why not do it? <laughs> yeah. You know, people don't think they're ugly anymore. I mean, you know, they're not super attractive, but now you can like put your logo in there and, you know, make it your color if it's a dark color. Um, so they're not terrible, you know, so um, they're pretty acceptable now, I think. Yeah, I was going to say that that are like... Um qr codes service that like you can track now so you can see how many people are scanning and everything else but also i think that are like the just like easy way instead of you pay for someone that like you know sometimes in marketing we can track any yeah. link that we want and you don't pay for those like tracking so you can kind of like play around with that too um okay last one yeah we have so many andy but last one so whoever drop a question here you can save later and send to andy but i know sure. we are over yeah um where is it here for smaller items that are not for resale within a larger package could you have the nutritional facts and weight on a separate overwrap of the larger package without having it on the smaller items um yes well I, i'm just speaking from experience or like like a purchasing experience. Um, yeah, in those cases, I'm pretty sure that outer case, outer carton will get the um, the nutrition facts and sort of the the technical content. And then your your interior stuff gets sort of that like standard, like, I don't know, I can't remember what it says, but like, you know, not labeled for 
purchase or resale or whatever, you know, like, so you, you, there is some kind of sort of like language you put on those smaller packaging on the inside. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's how you handle that. Um, you know, like variety packs, snack packs, um, often get those, you'll see that. So, um, you know, you're going to devote a good chunk of your, depending on how many products are inside, uh, the variety of products are inside that, that case or that carton. Um, you're going to devote a good amount of space, at least one panel to all the different individual products, technical content. And then, um, and then, yeah, on the inside, just, it'll just have that language. Hey, perfect. Well, Andy, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for everyone yeah. that is stay here with Thanks. us. I know we passed a little over, but yeah, Andy is always super available. He Oh yeah. If you guys don't know, he helped with startup CPG for a long time too. So we we still we love help. Andy. <laughs> you still help, yes. Um, but yeah, here is his contact or in the Slack, you can always reach out. And yeah, we will be sending the slides and recording by tomorrow to everyone. So thanks, Andy. Any final message or no, just just that, you know, it's a I know it feels like your initial packaging design or, you know, the first thing you sort of come out of the gate with is a um, sort of uphill battle, um, but it's only be the beginning and it, it, you continue to iterate and you'll continue to evolve your packaging as the category changes, as your audience changes, as your, you know, where you are out in the retail space changes. So just always be open to that and, and, um, but you try to be as as informed and as thoughtful in, in your approach as you can. Thank you. Love that. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll see you, everyone in Slack. Thanks again, Andy, and until Expo East. Yeah. See you there. Bye. <laughs>